Well, I'm very, very glad to be here in, uh, in Prague, uh, that I consider one of the three magic cities in, uh, in Europe, with Florence and Istanbul. Don't ask me why, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> it's a long story. Well, uh, when I received this title, uh, Three Physiological Concerts, well, I will touch three points. The first point uh, is the following. First, how many of you do measure, I don't say every day, but I say more than uh, twice a week, uh, twice per year, the esophageal uh, pressure changes? Uh, no more than five, six percent. Well, pressure pressure, first, second, the PCO2 cascade, and third, the hemodynamic gas exchange relationship. So I would like to touch three points that are usually quite ignored, or if not ignored, neglected in uh, intensive care of looking at the patient. Pleural pressure, here you see where is the esophageal pressure, and when we measure the esophageal pressure, which is the only way we have to measure without put a catheter in the thoracic cavity, uh, to measure uh, something which has related to the pleural pressure, esophageal pressure is, uh, is here, you can see here, is more or less in the middle of the esophagus. And when we measure the esophageal pressure, we do not measure the pleural pressure. We measure, unbelievably, the esophageal pressure. That's it. <laughs> the pressure which is into the esophagus. Now, uh, well, here is unpublished data. No, these are, unpu are published at the moment, are in uh, Journal of Applied Physiology. And uh, very simple, what is the, the determinants of the pleural and esophageal pressure. You know, I here have the esophagus. I have the gravitational forces, the compressive forces of the mediastinus. Here is about, uh, the density is about one. That means if I have here 10 centimeter, I have 10 centimeter here. Here the density in a normal lung is 0.2. In a patient with RDS, in these regions, is like the behigher, but certainly is not one. And so the, at the isogravitational plane, plane, the pleural pressure is lower than the esophageal pressure. Now, if you have some contraction, something else, you may have this one, which is far greater. So please forget to set the peep looking at the absolute esophageal pressure. This is not only to me a mistake, but is an extremely dangerous maneuver with possible very severe consequences on the patient for nothing. Now, the second rule which determines the difference between the pleural pressure and esophageal pressure is the volume matching between the thorax and the lung volume. Because they do not have the same shape, but they have to go together. So in some part of the lung, the pleural pressure is conditioned by the effort of the lung to adapt its shape to the shape of the lung, to the shape of the thorax. As an example, imagine here I have here a catheter and I have a big atelectasis, pure atelectasis. What do you expect here in the pleural pressure? The pleural pressure will become negative, more negative you know then you have a pure atelectasis, all the mediastinum move. It's an old radiological sign. But now, if I have the same volume, even if I don't have air, but I have a an, an, uh, lower pneumonia, but the same volume as a normal lung, the pleural pressure, 
will be normal and will be equal to the esophageal pressure. Here, if I have a greater volume, the pleural pressure will exceed the esophageal pressure. It's a rather simple rule, but this explains a lot of controversies that we sometimes find in a literature. So, the delta esophageal pressure, any way you look, when you change the pleural pressure, you change the esophageal pressure. The ratio is one to one. Whatever is the position, whatever you apply the gravitational forces, whatever is the change of the, of the, the problem of uh, volume matching. When you change one, you change the other one. So who cares about uh, the total, the absolute pressure of the pleura? I think it's extremely convenient to look uh, at the changes of esophageal pressure. Most of the thing of the previous lecture, if we had esophageal pressure, you don't have many doubts. What is the respiratory drive? If you take the esophageal pressure swings, what means to look at the pressure support without knowing what the patient does inside? I can put 20, 15, 5, and I have the same tidal volume, maybe. But look at what's happening inside. Maybe the swings are at 0, then 10, then 20. So without the pleural pressure, you don't have an idea of what's going on. Pleural pressure and control mechanical ventilation. So if you measure the chest wall elastance, I think the pleural pressure measurement is far more useful when you have some form of mixed ventilation, spontaneous and mechanical. But when you have uh, in pure mechanical uh, uh, ventilation, it sometimes is very useful to know what is the elastance uh, of uh, the chest wall compared to the lustres of the lung. Here, a simple example. You look in your alveolar, excuse me, in your uh, display or the ventilator, you have a 30 centimeter of water, the magic number, the plateau. 30, good. Now, in this particular case, you may have five of the 30 centimeter as a spent to move a very soft thorax, which include the abdomen. And 25 are spent to move the lung. Now, if I take an animal and I put this one, I can kill the animal in 48 hours with the RDS. This is lethal for the lung, this amount of pressure into the lung, spent to the lung, the transpulmonary pressure. Or I have the same, I have 30. But I spend 15 for the thorax and 15 for the lung. This is quite good for the lung, but it's terrible for the hemodynamics. Because this pressure surrounds the heart and surrounds the great vessels. And the relationship between airway pressure and the transpulmonary pressure, these are I don't remember which are RDS and which are not RDS. They look very simple, very similar. But this graph just tells you that the same plateau pressure may correspond for an absolute innocent or even very low transpulmonary pressure of 7, 8, maybe insufficient, or as high as 28, which is little. And my dear friends, you cannot imagine what's happening without measuring. There is no hands or eyes or something. You may suspect. Of course, if a patient looks as a balloon with the abdomen, you may suspect that something is wrong. But in some patients, you don't have the real possibility to discriminate this one. So, in mechanical ventilation, just to make an example, at the weight pressure, depending on the ratio between chest wall and the total, 
the pleural pressure may be 24, the transpulmonary pressure may be 24, 20, 15, 6. You remember the H1N1, right? In which uh, our uh, Australian colleagues, where is Bellomo? It's not here, good. Is uh, put a patient in ECMO. Look, because of terrible hypoxemia, look how we swear this patient. <coughs> Most of them were obese or pregnant women. What do they have in common? Very high chest wall elastance. Very high chest wall elastance means they were in this range. For the same plateau pressure, excuse me, for the same plateau pressure, they have a, <coughs> a very low transpulmonary pressure. That means we're just hyperventilated. And sometimes maybe in some of these patients could be enough to overcome 30 because it's not God coming from the sky and saying, use 30, if not, you go to the hell. <laughs> but this number do not mean nothing. You have to know the background physiology. Pleural pressure is spontaneous breathing. This seems very complicated. <coughs> but what tell you? <coughs> what tell you? Exactly what is the change in the transpulmonary pressure are these two components. Airway pressure, P mask, times the lung over a tot. If you have a patient and you know what is the lung and you know the tot, you don't have problems. You have uh, all uh, the component of these equations tell you where the patient is. If it's in pressure support, okay, how much is this pressure support and how much is uh, this one, the, this condition? And in spontaneous breathing, you have uh, exactly the same story. I mean, the energy provided by the ventilator and the energy provided by the respiratory muscles is always energy. I change the machine which apply to the lung a given energy. In one is the, the pay, the electrical power. The other one are the muscles. But the consequences are exactly the same. Therefore, for the same power, or PMOS, the lung strain may be too low or too high. And we do not like either. Second, PCO2. <coughs> One of the things um, nice with the PCO2, because in, when we speak about the RDS, RDS, hypoxemia, PO2, PF, and so on. Well, let's see. If you have a change of uh, one millimeter of mercury in your patient, 40 to 41, do you worry? I don't think so. Is it still almost in the range of mistake of the measurement, right? Even more. <coughs> but <coughs> if you have eight or 10 millimeters change of PO2, are you worried from 70 to 60? Of course. Now, look at uh, what's up in normal physiology. We come in the lung with 40, let's see, and we get out uh, with, uh, uh, this is the delta of uh, oxygen content, five centimeters of, of uh, five, excuse me, five milliliters per hundred of blood of oxygen correspond to a jump of 40 in delta pressure. In the PCO2, the same amount of exchange in content. Let's see the respiratory quotient is equal to one. Five in one case, five in the other case. How much is the jump of PCO2 from 45 to 40? So in terms of gas content, the gas transport, the gas exchange, one millimeter of mercury correspond to more or less 10 millimeters of oxygen. And if somebody call me 
more and more rare. Asking, uh, well, I would like to know how is my patient. Eh? And uh, because the PO2 is very low, I say, who cares about the PO2 and oxygen? Please, tell me two things. How much is the PCO2 and how much is the total ventilation? If the total, 12 of total ventilation, good. PCO2, 41. It's terrible. Because uh, what really is important uh, to judge the change, the structural change of the lung uh, is not the PO2. In an acute edema, the lung structure is preserved. It's just wet. But with time uh, and with raw mechanical ventilation, you start to disturb the structure to break the extracellular, uh, extracellular matrix, to break some alveolar uh, walls and so on, and this is reflected by the PCO2. Over the time, the PO2 stays there, but the dead space goes up, PO2 goes up, and ventilation. This is very old, but still the numbers are the same. And this is an early intermediate and later RDS. Change completely the world. And this is done by the PCO2. <coughs> and uh, another thing that um, we are used to measure very often and to see the shunt effects uh, of uh, PACO2. Let's see. I have the PVCO2 which come to the lung. No? Part goes into the lung. This is a capillary CO2 which is in equilibrium. <coughs> Excuse me about the terrible influence. I, I don't think it's a coronavirus, but um, <laughs> you know, you never know. Uh, Are you sure? Uh, no, no, I'm not sure you know. Uh, PCO2, the capillary CO2 is equal to the mythical alveolar CO2 that nobody can measure. Okay? And then the good the blood, the very red, goes uh, and forms the arterial PCO2. But if I have a shunt, part of the CO2 content goes, uh, without uh, having any change in its composition, mix, and you have the shunt effect. So greater is the shunt, greater is the difference between alveolar CO2 and PaCO2, right? Good. Now, let's see. I arrive with VCO2. This is shunted. Part goes to the lung. Goes to the lung, and we have the expired CO2, the capillary CO2, the PaCO2, and then this is equal of the PaCO2 of the regions of the lung which are ventilated and perfused. But now, let's assume that I have a part of the lung which is ventilated but not perfused. So the so-called alveolar VDVT. What's happened? This PaCO2 is transformed in what? In the entitled CO2. Then I add the anatomical the space, and this, this, the mix expired the CO2. Now, remember, the number of molecules is always the same, but change the spacing which are distributed. Now, now let's, con let's consider the, the perfect, I want to know what is the perfect gas exchanger. The perfect gas exchanger, the shunt, how much is? Zero, great. So this part uh, does not exist, right? In the perfect gas exchanger, how much is the alveolar the space? Zero. Okay, so this part, the entire PCO2, will be equal to the PACO2. The PACO2 will be equal to the capillary CO2, if the gas exchanger is perfect, the capillary CO2 will be equal to the PaCO2. 
So if you take the <coughs> entire PCO2, divide the arterial PCO2 in a perfect gas exchange, what will be the ratio? One. More you are uh, uh, far from la for one, uh, worse is the gas exchange, the gas exchanger. Because of two reasons. <coughs> and one minus this ratio is what we call uh, alveolar the space, which is not the alveolar the space. It's a mixture of uh, shunt effect and uh, alveolar the space. So if you have a patient, you go and you see, PCO, entire CO2 is a zero, this ratio is 0 0.6. The patient has very few probability to survive. If it's greater than 0 0.8, or 0 0.9, you can sleep quite easily without great problem. It takes five seconds, any times you have one blood gases, everybody is at the end and the CO2 is there. Nobody looked, or they looked to the entire CO2 to judge the possible change in cardiac output, which is possible. But uh, if, you have, if you have in mind the sequence of this, uh, so in idea gas exchange, alveolar PCO2 is equal arterial, alveolar PCO2, entire CO2, no alveolar space divide to E1. And <coughs> variation is of a GI pressure. Okay, we spoke about this. Gas exchange and hemodynamic relationship, uh, which is another funny thing. That uh, uh, we know since the decades, but the message didn't get through. Because when you go and you say, I have to set PEEP, wait, PEEP 5, PO2 56, uh, PEEP 10, uh, 61, good, 15, uh, 64, well, it's great, uh, the respond to the PEEP. And the people look at the response to PEEP looking at the PO2. I do not deny, of course, that uh, the two things are related. But the gas exchange, my dear friend, is made by two things, the gas side and the perfusion side. Depends by the VAQ. We cannot look only to the VA part. VA, I intend the gas part, the PO2 in the, the recruitment and so on. This is my Friend Dansker, I don't know what, uh, what he did. I think he did this paper, then become a businessman. Um, probably I hope he's very rich now. But this is published on uh, chest, if I remember correctly. And you see that here you have a PEEP, 10, 20, 10, 20, 10, 20. And here is the cardiac output and the shunt. And you see that they go absolutely together. And the conclusion of this paper, which are always excessive when you, because nothing is 100% one or 0% the other one. We have always a mixture. But the conclusion of this paper were that the effect of people were through the hemodynamic. Now, we did that in more, more modern time, never published this, uh, this kind of thing because are not new, but this is the PaO2, this is the weight pressure. And you see, any times you take up the, the weight pressure, the PO2 goes up. But uh, do you see any difference between this? Very difficult. These were absolutely not recruited with the CT scan. These were highly recruited. And this is the PO2 and the cardiac output. And you see, as the cardiac output goes down, the PO2 goes up, and <coughs> both in recruiters and non recruiters. This is the shunt fraction. Who measures still the shunt? I start to cry. <laughs> I mean, 
how can you judge the oxygenation, the, the status, without having this? You look at PO2 and FiO2, and some Americans say, well, they forget the PO2 because it's too costly to put the barrel gas machine. Use the SAO2 with a pulse oximeter divided by FiO2. This was the discussion we had during the Berlin definition of RDS. This is not medicine. Shant is the best way we have to judge the oxygenator status and tell you immediately the shant that what is be obliged you to go to the venous side because any time you change something and arteria goes up, if the venous side go, stay there or goes down, no good. That means the cardiac output goes down. And you know that immediately. And last things, no, last things I would not to touch the P because you can, you can ask, how oh, I touch? Well, you can ask very, very rapidly. So we have the PO2, we have uh, said all this, but the PIP, how, how can we select PIP? And still we have a big discussion and so on. Now we have a lot of, uh, when we compare the high PIP and lower PIP, remember, when you see higher and lower, be always suspicious. Means our ignorance. Because higher should be greater than 15, greater than 20, what means higher and lower in different populations? means anything to me. Anyway, we measured in a several study higher versus lower PIP, volotrauma versus atelic trauma. With higher PIP, we have the risk of volotrauma, we decrease the risk of atelic trauma. With lower PIP, we have increased risk of atelic trauma, decreased risk of volotrauma. Very simple, right? And we have, in the, general, in the general population with RDS, we have a lot of studies that tell us that, that between 7 and 7, 8, and 15 of people, uh, the risk benefit of higher and lower are exactly the same. So don't that crazy. But if you go up a little bit, the volotrauma wins. And you can kill the patients if we increase the pressures over certain limit. I think we will have an occasion to come back on this basic concept. But remember that it's impossible to look at the gas exchange without considering the hemodynamic. Because the greater price that we have to pay any times we touch the ventilator is the hemodynamic response. So we give tons of water, tons of cardioactive drug, but uh, this is a very high price to be paid by the patient. I thank you for the attention. <laughs>